Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Siddharth Prabhu. I'm a postdoc in the string group here. And uh, today my talk is titled, Where is the Information in the Universe Stored? Uh, before I start the talk, I want to say that I'm not going to bore you with too many technical details, uh, considering the amount of time we have and the diverse audience we have. Uh, if you want more technical details, I would refer you to this paper that we put out a week ago. And this is work with Alok and uh, two, of, uh, two of ICTS people, Suvarat and Pushkal. Uh, and uh, uh, so, the, so the title is, is where is the information in the universe stored? And by universe here, uh, I would, I'm referring really to flat space times. Our universe is not exactly flat, but it's to a large approximation we could consider it to be flat. And so, le uh, so let's start. <clears throat> First, let's, let's consider the hypothetical uh, black box that you know, all of us are looking at. So various physical systems that we all consider, uh, we, these could be uh, systems of all kinds. You could have all, you know, atomic systems, molecules, and things in there. And you study this by making various kinds of measurements on it, and you try to measure properties of these, of these things. And then you come up with what, what could be inside the box. So uh, we, we are going to hear talks about various such physical systems. Uh, people are studying all kinds of systems here at ICTS. Uh, and, uh, and the box size, so this is, this is a bigger box, which con contains you know, all kinds of uh, uh, fluid dynamics is happening inside this box. Uh, some of us like to study even bigger boxes, which contain uh, colliding black holes. And then you measure gravitational waves, and you try to infer properties of these guys. Uh, for today's talk, I'm going to try to take the box size as big as possible. And uh, I'm going to take the box to be the whole universe. So if the box is the whole universe, and we're trying to make measurements on it and try to infer uh, uh, things that are happening inside the universe, then a natural place for you to be at, if you're trying to do this without really opening the box, is to be on the boundary of the universe. So imagine you're at the boundary of the universe and you're trying to make measurements and you're trying to figure out what's happening in the universe. Uh, the question is, is it possible? Is it possible for you to make all kinds of measurements and infer processes that are happening inside? Well, let's go back to the smallest box. Uh, uh, and let's ask already here if you had uh, uh, some, if you had an elementary particle, let's say you had a charge sitting inside and you are allowed to be outside, you are allowed to make all kinds of measurements, can you infer what's, what's inside the box? Well, we know uh, uh, from Gauss's law that if you are just outside and you're trying to, let's say, measure the electric field, uh, then there are some things that you can't really see. Because let's say you, had, you can't distinguish between having a, a small charge Q there versus a small charge Q surrounded by a minus Q outside that, that, uh, that positive charge. You know that, uh, 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 you know that, uh, sorry, so I wanted to say you, you can't distinguish between having no charge inside or having a positive charge Q and a negative charge Q, where in both of these cases, you know, outside the electric field will be zero and you won't be able to really tell until you open the box and sort of separated the system into two subsystems and then studied it. Uh, well, it turns out that, uh, that the situation is not quite the same when gravity is involved. And the reason is, Let's, let's look at a particular time slice of the universe. Okay, so this, this picture is supposed to depict a particular time slice. And, uh, and this is, of course, 2D, but, but you're supposed to imagine a 3D version of this. And there are various masses sitting in this, in this space time. And uh, then you can ask if, there is a, if there's a mass sitting here, uh, you do the same kind of thing. You, you, you are around it, and you make some measurement of the gravitational field. You can infer the mass. But there's no such thing as anti-gravity. There's nothing that, that, that you, can, you can't put an anti-mass there and sort of screen this mass. So, so you might imagine that, 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 you know, that in this case, you, you're probably not going to be able to, to, uh, to screen out the effect of the mass inside and, and produce zero gravitational field. Well, um, but, but even in classical gravity, people have, have uh, come up with some very smart constructions where even though this is true, if you are at the boundary, just making measurements from the boundary would not be able to get you all information that's inside. And that's because you can get actually a different mass distributions inside which will produce the same, uh, uh, same gravitational field on the boundary. Uh, uh, but all this is true classically, and, and we are going to try to say something more when we go to the quantum theory. So. Um, uh, to do that, first, first let's, uh, uh, by the way, there's, there's, so, so that's, that's one problem that, that you'll have with the system. And there's, there's one other problem. And that problem is, is, you can see if you look at the causal structure. Okay? So this diagram here is supposed to uh, represent the causal structure of the universe we are in. So what this means is that if a particular event happens here at this red dot, 
then uh, that event really is influenced by everything in its past light cone. That's the whole region from which light can reach this point. And it influences things in its future light cone. So if you are sitting in this time slice here, which is here titled the hypersurface of the present, and, uh, and you are somewhere around here, you are not supposed to be influenced by this, and you can't influence this point. So which means that if if you, are at the, if you are at a time slice and you're really at the boundary of this time slice, then how are you going to be affected or how are you going to affect anything that happens here at the center? Uh, so this also seems to suggest that, that you will not be able to really tell, uh, uh, tell between things that, that are happening here at the center. Um, so so these, these, are, these are sort of uh, issues that, that will come up if you try to understand, uh, can, uh, if you are trying to understand this question of whether you can really get to all the information in the universe from the boundary. Um, uh, if you have a, a theory of, of let's say, uh, of electromagnetism, so QED here is quantum electrodynamics, then we can really explicitly write down things, write down operators, whose effect of which we can't really tell from the boundary. It doesn't really matter what, what uh, the, the, the details of this operator are, but it matters that we can really write down operators. And in the quantum theory, when we say we are making measurements, we are really uh, looking at expectation values of observables. So, uh, so this, this observable here is some observable A, uh, which has some probability distribution, and, expectation and, and the expectation value of that is, is what we try to measure. So here, this expectation value is measured in the vacuum versus this expectation value being measured in the state that is created by this operator. And you really can't tell between the two uh, in this, if you just had electromagnetism. And this is for, this, for the same reason that, that uh, is sort of shown in this, in, this, uh, in this representation, because things that are outside uh, on, this, on this time slice, uh, we say commute with things that, with, that with, you know, operators that are at this red point, which means that they can't really affect each other. So, so, you can't, so you can't tell. Well, in a theory of gravity, uh, something different happens. So what happens is that uh, let's, let's consider first uh, asympt asymptotically flat spacetimes, which just means that if we go back to this picture here, there are various masses inside. But if you're really far away, things look flat. Okay. Um, so, so in asymptotically flat spacetimes, uh, we can do one thing, we can, uh, so, so firstly, in any theory of gravity, it's kind of hard to come up with a definition of mass, which is local, okay? Uh, and this has to do with the very nature of gravity and to, the, and, and, and to do with the nonlinear equations that are, that are in classical gravity. So, uh, uh, but, but a very natural definition of mass or energy is really given by uh, the strength of the gravitational field on the boundary. So, so this gives you the energy of the total space-time. And this already starts to uh, start to have a flavor of maybe things are, are really there on the boundary. So you go ahead and try to quantize this theory. You, you add quantum mechanics to this picture, and you see that the Hamiltonian is a boundary term. What this means is that you measure the I mean, it's, it's, it, you measure the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, and that's the energy. And the energy is really given by uh, by an integral or by an expression on the boundary. Okay, but this see, but this gives you a little bit more because let's say now you're, if you're on the boundary. And, and you are considering all possible functions of boundary observables. You call that your algebra on the boundary. Uh, if the Hamiltonian is a boundary operator, this immediately tells you that you can really use an operator to project onto the vacuum state. Uh, uh, because, because this projector is just a function of this Hamiltonian. It goes like e to the minus h. So, so if you have the Hamiltonian in your algebra, then you really have the projector onto the vacuum in your algebra. Uh, and already the rules of quantum mechanics, uh, uh, when added in, uh, give you uh, some uh, one other uh, striking result. And, and that is that if you have access to the vacuum, you can really go to any other state. Okay? And this is a very striking uh, result, which comes from uh, uh, basic quantum field theory, which I'm not going to have time to explain here. But, but it's already true uh, without, without even putting gravity into the picture. Okay, so now if we combine these two ingredients, what you get is that is, is this is, is, a, is a neat uh, result. So what you get is, let's say you had two states, psi1 and psi2, and let's say these two states were distinct, which means that there exists some operator whose expectation value you can measure, and, and uh, sorry, this should have been a not equal to, uh, and this expectation value is different in these two states. So, you, so there exists such an operator. 
Well, if there is if there exists such an operator, you can write down its general expression in terms of some basis states n and m. Uh, I already said that these basis states can be written uh, in terms of some operator acting on the vacuum. This operator can then be really shrunk down to the boundary. And uh, this is also an argument I'm not going to make, but this, the, the details of this are there in our paper. And this involves a, a bit of complex analysis, but it's not, not too much. Uh, but when you put these, this back into this equation here, what you get is that your operator can be written as things which are really totally on the boundary. So in between here, this P0 here is the projector onto the vacuum. These guys are operators on the boundary. So the whole thing is really on the boundary. So what you have found then is that if you gave me two states, which could be distinguished by some operator Q, this operator Q, I can write to be on the boundary. So, so this means that if, if I had two states, I could really construct an operator who's, who, who, uh, which I could use to distinguish between these two states. And, and this operator I have access to just from the boundary. Uh, what, what I'm saying is all true for, uh, for the semi-classical theory, and, uh, and, and I've omitted some details, but it's true for flat space-time too. Um, but, but, uh, but that's not the full theory of quantum gravity. So in order to make some uh, a statement about, uh, about, uh, about, full, uh, about the full theory of quantum gravity, we have to make certain assumptions. And these assumptions really are assumptions about the vacuum structure, which we expect to be true. Uh, coming from the semi-classical theory. We don't expect the full theory to change really things about the vacuum. Uh, 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 we, we, we expect the approximate vacuum structure to still, to still be the same. So the assumptions are that we can identify the vacuum from the boundary. So I told you that we have access to the Hamiltonian and, and, in, and we need access to some other charges too if these charges are around. But we can identify the vacuum from the boundary. And the other assumption is that we can map any vacuum to any other vacuum from the boundary. The third assumption is that the energies of all our states don't go arbitrarily negative. Okay, with these three assumptions, we get the result that all information about massless excitations in any state can be really obtained from the boundary. Uh, uh, and I'm not going to go, uh, since I'm already out of time, not going to go uh, to a stronger result, which is about uh, how information is stored at null infinity. Um, and, uh, and I'm just going to say two more things. One is that uh, one thing that is really uh, relevant for this uh, discussion is that we are allowed to make quantum measurements versus classical measurements. So instead of uh, just measuring things like the mass, which is the expectation value of some operator m, we can measure correlators like this. And using this, we can really test out these ideas of how information can be obtained about these excitations. So for details about this, uh, uh, please tune in to Chandra's talk in the next session. Uh, there are some striking implications for the black hole information paradox that come from this discussion. Uh, and, uh, and for the details of this, please uh, uh, tune in to Pushkal's talk tomorrow. Okay, thank you.